Today, you'll see sleek, sophisticated, expensive, high-tech power boats and flat-out 200-mile-per-hour drag boats with plenty of danger on the liquid quarter mile. Plus the excitement of unlimited hydroplanes. Next, here on the Superchargers. Superchargers, national championship and unique motorsports. Hi everyone and welcome to the Superchargers. I'm Jan Gabriel and this has turned out to be an absolutely beautiful day. You know there are 13 million boaters in this country and they all have to follow strict safety regulations because boating can be dangerous. But even more dangerous are the expensive high-powered racing boats that you're going to see here on the program today. Now it was six years ago right here on Lake Michigan in front of this beautiful Chicago shoreline that we brought you our very first supercharger program. It was about offshore powerboat racing and that's the subject of our first of three segments you'll see today including extraordinary high-tech developments in the sport and the human element, the heart, the soul and the egos that propel the sport. Six years ago offshore powerboat racing was a sport dominated by V-hauls boats built to handle rough ocean waves. Cockpits were all open and contained a stand-up crew of three, the driver, throttleman, and navigator. For television to cover an offshore powerboat race, it requires helicopters, lots of them. Offshore powerboats most often race on the high seas of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. There, the waves are far apart. When you race on the Great Lakes, waves are closer together, making it much more difficult, battering the competitors with waves that seem to come from all directions at once, slamming the boats down hard into the water, making for a very rough ride. Two great boats that were always sensational side-by-side -side competitors were Man of War and Nightwing. Both were V-Hauls that ran in the modified class at speeds up to 90 miles an hour. The V-Hauls weren't the only fast boats of the early 1980s. A few hardy catamarans were beginning to take their chances, like this boat, Love It, and Lee Bomar's Wolverine. Catamarans had just recently been introduced, and they were gaining a reputation for speed and a tendency to break apart in rough water. Now, six years later, the catamarans completely dominate the sport. Improvements in construction have made them more seaworthy. They're faster than any V-Hall with top speeds of over 100 miles an hour. The superboats are the ultimate in this sport of big bucks and big egos. Superboats such as this one carry four powerful engines that deliver an awesome 3,200 horsepower and sound like a fleet of 747s. The high-tech safety cockpit contains four men, the driver, throttle man, and two navigators. It's a fast way to spend big money. This 35-foot catamaran named Special Edition is completely state-of-the-art in the open class. Its two-man crew is the father and son team of John and J.D. D'Elia. Between them, they've captured three world championships. They use the latest trend in safety gear, a closed F-16 cockpit, similar to what you'd find in fighter planes. All offshore powerboats are custom-built to individual specifications. Craig Barry, driver of this 38-foot catamaran, prefers a fresh ocean breeze. His boat is open except for a small aluminum canopy. It has two 700-horsepower engines. The crew stands up in this cockpit. It's the old-fashioned way. Today, most drivers are seated. The Canadian Homes Challenge is a major contender from outside of the United States. It's owned and driven by Lauren Libel, a 37-year-old real estate magnate from Ontario who's hot to win. The boat he'll have to beat is Swiftshore, a 38-foot catamaran that's owned and driven by Bob Kaiser from Detroit, Michigan. Winning world championships is what he loves best, and he runs consistently in first place. One thing is certain, in a sport where winning is a way of life, the competition is always going to be intense. Boat owners are all successful businessmen who spare no expense to win. It can all add up to as much as a half a million dollars. 
classes in offshore powerboat racing are rated on the size of the boat and the horsepower of the engines. Everyone runs the course at the same time. This colorful 33-footer named Cat is owned by Al Crop out of Sherville, Wisconsin and runs in the modified class. Dirty Laundry is another example of the modified catamaran. It has open cockpits for the two-man crew and can race with the big boats at an average speed of 93 miles an hour. Inboard engines and mercury outdrives are what set it apart for the pro stocks. This pro stock is a 32-foot Douglas Skater catamaran named Miss Don Q. Rum from the island of Puerto Rico. It's equipped with three, count them, three 265 horsepower outboard engines, moving the boat along at better than 90 miles an hour. Make no mistake about it, offshore powerboat racing is fast and dangerous in every class. Just watching these powerful boats, it's easy to see why the revolution of the catamarans has made the sport more popular and exciting than ever before. You know, the high cost of offshore powerboat racing limits it to just a select few who can really participate. You know, one of those boats can cost as much as a half a million dollars. You know as well as I do that you can buy a yacht for that kind of money. Here to prove my point and joining me on the program today is Linda Marshall. You're absolutely right, Jan. Here at one of Chicago's harbors, there are several half million dollar yachts. But as we continue to focus on racing boats, I'm going to tell you about blown top fuel hydro drag boats, the fastest and most dangerous of all racing boats. They travel the liquid quarter mile at speeds up to 250 miles an hour. This story begins at the most modern marine dragway in the world, Firebird International Raceway in Phoenix, Arizona. It was the day of the World Finals. The race was down to the final four boats. The water was smooth as glass. Boats were running fast. It was a perfect day to show what blown top fuel drag racing was all about. Dave Nolte in the boat Liberty was in lane number one. Alongside was Billy Todd, affectionately known as Billy the Kid. Poised in their 3,000 horsepower drag boats, their eyes were on the countdown clock, waiting for the running start that would send them across the water, sometimes airborne, at over 200 miles an hour, completing the quarter mile in just over five seconds. The word hydro describes the hull of these fast boats, which sit on only three points, much like a tripod. The bottom half of the propeller is in the water, along with two sponsors or pods that are near the driver. As you can see, once the boats are at speed, they are very fast and very risky to drive. In the round, it was Billy the Kid who won it. He hit a speed of just over 206 miles an hour, and the crowds loved it. Next up was Dexter Tuttle from Colton, California, firing his engine on the line. He was a world record holder with great expectations for the day. He was driving a boat called Nitro Express. His competition was John Burroughs and the Burroughs and McIntyre boat. The winner would meet Billy Todd in the World Finals. Burroughs' boat was brand new. He'd had some handling problems earlier in the day, but now hope they've been solved. It was a close race all the way, but John Burroughs made the ultimate mistake of redlining at the start. He was just too anxious and hit the starting line before the green light. It would be Dexter Tuttle and Billy the Kid in the World Finals. As the two finalists went back to prepare for the championship showdown, we took a look at this beautiful motorsports complex sanctioned by the International Hot Boat Association. Up to this point, the safety crews fortunately had been sitting idle. But if need be, they could go into action in a hurry. After all, drag boat racing is still risky business. Here's what can happen when things go wrong. This is a fire that is actually more spectacular than it is dangerous. The oil from the motor has spilled out onto the exhaust pipes and has erupted in flames. But it doesn't last long, and the driver is okay because he's well protected in his driving suit. New safety innovations are being built into these boats constantly, including safety capsules. In the past, they even tried parachutes on the drivers. Sometimes it worked well, sometimes it didn't. As in most motorsports, accidents occur either because of mechanical failure or driver error. Drag boats are run on the ragged edge of their ability to go down the race course. This is where they function in their fastest mode, and that's where the driver wants it to be. But if you go beyond that, then oftentimes an accident will result. And of course, the safety crews in this sport are outstanding. Keep your eye on this boat. Watch it carefully as it begins to get out of control. The nose gets a little too high as the airflow pushes it upward. 
At this point, the die is cast, and all the driver can hope for is that he is pulled away from the crashing boat. In car racing, you hope the vehicle stays intact and you ride out a crash. In drag boat racing, it's just the opposite. You want to get away from the debris. Again, as you can see, the safety crew is in the water within seconds to aid the driver. Here's another situation where the boat gets too high in the water. At this point, the driver has no control. Weaving back and forth, the boat is on a path to self-destruction. When this happens, it's always an expensive proposition. Given the fact the driver is okay, you have still lost an expensive boat and engine. The engines can be retrieved and rebuilt, but you do have to start with a new boat. Racing drag boats is a hobby for those with a few extra bucks in their pocket. It's a costly venture that takes a lot of your time, effort, and perseverance. By the way, all the drivers you've seen in these accidents were okay. Naturally, there were a few bumps and bruises. When you hit the water at these kinds of speeds, it will rattle you. If you've ever done a belly flop in a swimming pool, or fallen off water skis at 30 miles an hour, you can well imagine what one of these drivers goes through hitting the water at 150 to 200 miles an hour. Now back to our story of the world finals. With both boats highly tuned, they were ready to go at it. Everything was on the line. World title, a big payoff, and the prestige of winning. 30-year-old Dexter Tuttle knew that his Nitro Express could certainly get the job done. Billy Todd, the 54-year-old grandfather from Alburn, California, was concentrating on the 1,320 feet of water in front of him. Everyone knew this was for all the marbles. Now watching each other closely, they moved out side by side. You could feel the power building in the engines. At the green light, they were exactly as the throttles were pushed wide open, Dexter Tuttle's supercharger exploded into oblivion. Two seconds later, Billy Todd became the world champion, a title to add to his many accomplishments, which included being the fastest and the quickest man on the liquid quarter mile. Luck was with Billy the Kid that day in the world finals, but a few months later, on a small lake in California, Billy's luck ran out. He was killed doing what he loved best, racing drag boats. More recently, however, new technical innovations have helped make the sport a great deal safer. I'm Linda Marshall. Now let's go back to Jan Gabriel on Lake Michigan. Well, thanks, Linda. You know, boating can be fun, an awful lot of fun, but it can also be very dangerous. If you're a boater, make sure you follow all the safety rules. Now, I do know a couple of guys who don't follow the rules, but it's quite all right, because they're up in Wisconsin Dells at the Tommy Bartlett Water Show, and they are stunt boat drivers. Right after we take a quick peek at them, we'll be back with more here on the Superchargers. Welcome back to the Superchargers. I'm Jan Gabriel, and today we're taking a look at some of the fastest powerboats in the world. You know, when it comes to the racing fraternity, they consider the unlimited hydroplanes as the elite. And of course, they are exciting. The aerodynamics are most interesting to look at, and the engines are always thunderous to listen to. And each has a story of its driver and its boat. And today, it's the story of young Steve Reynolds. Unlimited hydroplane racing is a sport of speed and endurance that demands tremendous control on the part of the driver. The boats are dominated by the new powerful turbines and supercharged aircraft engines that allow them to run a complicated course reaching speeds nearly 200 miles an hour on the straightaways. One gust of air and the boat can easily turn over on itself and in the tight turns everything depends on the driver's skill and judgment. There are a thousand stories to be told about this risky and compelling sport. We chose Cellular One and Steve Reynolds because as a young man of intelligence and courage, he most typifies the spirit of the sport. First, let's meet the man. Announcer Don Poyer interviewed Steve Reynolds and crew chief Jim Lucero. But the two of you have worked very closely this year. 
You went to driving school, things like that. How's your relationship going, Steve? First, oh, I, I'm. I can't tell you how comfortable I am with it. I mean, and Jim is making me think. He's making me realize things that I never approached before. I think it's just a very practical approach, really. And our, our basic format is to what did we do wrong? Where can we improve? How can we improve? Um, he's a good teacher. Jim? I don't know if you could call me a teacher or not, but I really enjoy working with Steve uh, because he pays attention. You know, he, I, you know, a lot of people, uh, a lot of drivers especially, will, will let their ego get in the way of, of listening to a crew chief uh, basically analyze what they're doing out on the race course. But Steve and I have developed, uh, I think, a really good relationship and where we can communicate well. I can sometimes see some things from the shore that he can't necessarily see what's going on in the race boat because so many things are happening to him so fast and vice versa. He can help me with the race boat and things that I can't really tell from the shore. And uh, I really like the communication. In other words, the communication is vital and you've got it. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely essential. A championship event was on the line at the Governor's Cup race in Madison, Indiana. The boats moved out for the start of the second heat race, including Steve Reynolds and his new boat with a state-of-the-art turbine engine. He was up against two other turbines and a boat with a supercharged piston engine. Nearly 100,000 fans were lined up along the shore, trying to keep cool in the 90-degree heat. Thundering down for the start, the boats were even as they bobbed and weaved under a surge of power. The drivers concentrating on the starter as they roared past. Reynolds was alongside of Chip Hanauer, but pulling away fast, both boats were skyrocketing down towards turn number one. Reynolds was shaking him down as he led the field going into the first turn. It was up to the rest of the boats to play catch up. For Reynolds, it was the kind of race you dream about. He was out front and beginning to run away from the rest of the field. One boat found itself in trouble but recovered quickly as the cellular one surged down the back straight away. you're getting a little more confidence in your boat. It's a combination, Jim, of, uh, of Steve getting used to the boat and, uh, and Jim just doing his magic. You know, it's a little touch here and a little touch there. Every time we go out, it's getting a little faster. Faster, all right. The boat was exceptional, and Steve Reynolds' confidence couldn't have been higher. This was to be the day, his day, as he set out for his third heat race. At the start, he was once again the hot setup, blasting down the waterway, leading into turn number one. Two other highly competitive boats were hot on his rooster tail, driven by Jim Kropfeld and Chip Hanauer. They both had boats powerful enough to stay with the cellular one. Approaching the first turn, all the boats were in good shape and lightning fast. Reynolds must have felt the pressure as the skid fin dug in. He rounded out the corner and pushed the throttle to full speed, up to 180, 185 miles per hour. The boat is bouncing. There's air under the boat. Too much air. It's going to fly and blow over. The boat crashes down into the water, ripping off the sponsor, twisting and turning. The boat lands right side up. The safety crew is there in seconds. The other boats have since gone by and cleared the wreckage. Paramedics dive into the water to extract Steve Reynolds from what remains of the boat. What has started out as an exciting, confidence-filled day has now ended in near tragedy. As is often the case, Reynolds was the victim of a blowover. That is when the air pushes the boat up and over on itself. Let's watch again now as air builds under the boat, the left sponsor pushing it upward, upward, out of the control of the driver. 
At this point, there is no return for the inevitable. Hurling it through the air, the boat comes down on its left sponson, ripping it off, with the rest of the boat crashing and rolling into the water. Steve Reynolds spent six months in a hospital. The new innovations in safety equipment saved his life. Steve Reynolds, the driver of Cellular One, is making an excellent recovery, working every day. We'll be right back with more here on the Superchargers from this beautiful harbor here in downtown Chicago. We're back, and it's a beautiful day here on Lake Michigan. You know, there are many factors in boat racing that remain out of the control of the driver. But still, the thrill of being the fastest boat on the water constantly draws men to the sport. For the Superchargers, I'm Jan Gabriel.